Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Erin Elmore. My guests today are Sarah Hahn and Ellie Foster, both directors of education at the Kevin Love Fund, which is a fund established by the NBA player Kevin Love to break the stigma around mental health and inspire people to live their healthiest lives while providing tools for both mental and physical health. Sarah Hahn holds a master's degree in human development studies from Vanderbilt University and a master's degree in education from Pepperdine University. Using her experience as a teacher in both public and private schools, Sarah co-founded the nonprofit Determined to Succeed to support students academically, emotionally, and financially through middle school, high school, and college. Ellie Foster holds a master's degree in educational psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD in literacy education from University of Colorado at Boulder. Ellie is an advocate for centering creativity, social justice, and emotional expression and the way that schools approach social emotional learning and trauma-sensitive practices. She's worked as a high school English teacher, literacy researcher, a K through 12 teacher educator, and an activist for youth experiencing homelessness. We're excited to have Sarah and Ellie with us today to talk about their involvement with the Kevin Love Fund and the work that they're doing around children's mental wellness. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank Thanks for having, having us. us. Yes. Well, I'm curious as we get started, do you want to just explain to our listeners who is Kevin Love for those who don't follow the NBA? What's his story and how did this program come about? Sure. So Kevin, um, for those who don't know him, and he's pretty well known now, I think in the mental health field as well as in basketball, but he, uh, several years ago, he was playing for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And several years ago, he had a pretty massive panic attack on court. It was a nationally televised game, and it was very public and difficult for him to kind of get through in that moment. And he decided to kind of be the change he wanted to see in the world when that happened. Um, And instead of um, hiding from it, he decided to really bravely and vulnerably share his struggles with anxiety and depression. And he published an essay, a personal essay in the Players' Tribune um, expressing all of this. And the result, the kind of outpouring of support and the movement he really started in response to that, to his sharing and his um, discussing a difficult time in his life, inspired him to start this fund. And he brought together experts in education, like Ellie and myself, and experts in psychiatry and psychology. And we all kind of came around the table and discuss what we thought should be um, in the drinking water for teens around this country and world. um, And to create a space that Kevin felt if he had had this in middle school and high school, uh, it would have really been beneficial to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how did you both get involved in working with the Kevin Love Fund? Did he recruit you himself personally? I mean, how did you stumble into this? Through my work in Los Angeles with Determined to Succeed, I had met Regina Miller, who's the executive director of this organization. And I knew that Ellie was the perfect person, as you will soon see, to bring on to kind of complete our team. And I'll let Ellie uh, share how she got involved at the same time. It's all happened. Well, you know, right when Kevin was um, sharing his vulnerable story in the Players' Tribune and really kind of um, setting the tone for for athletes in a big way, he was one of the first people to kind of come forward and and talk about his mental health. So when he was sort of modeling vulnerability in that way, I, at that moment, was completing my PhD research and I had been studying, um, you know, what can we as teachers do to help students to feel um, safe talking about how they're feeling um, and sharing challenging life experiences in the classroom. And I was part of a larger research study that was over a 10 year span. And we had been asking this question as kind of a team. And what we found from that work was that teachers modeling vulnerability in the same way that Kevin did in his writing was this pedagogy that really opened the doors to students um, to to bring their emotional lives into the classroom. So you'll see when we, we talk more about the program today, you'll see that that's kind of a a through line for our curriculum is this idea of, you know, we don't have to kind of check part of ourselves at the door. We can bring our whole self into the classrooms, teachers and students included. Love it. So essentially you guys are the experts that are writing the curriculum for the Kevin Love Fund. Is that right? That's right. Yes. You know, we all kind of talked about, sorry, Ellie. Um, We all talked about when this first came together, how when we were younger, or for me, even now with my teenage children, I have a daughter in middle school and a daughter in high school, 
that there's a lot of mandatory learning that goes on in the classroom. Kids spend hours memorizing the periodic table of elements or algebraic equations or historic facts or um, verb conjugations in Spanish or French. But, um, but there's not this mandatory learning in understanding that everyone is going through similar psychosocial stages of development as they grow up or that your thoughts and your emotions and your behaviors are all connected. And so it was really important to Kevin that we kind of taught these little nuggets to students so they could really understand truly how their um, social emotional development is occurring. And so we kind of put together what we all thought ought to be mandatory learning in this realm, at least. I, of course, not to knock any of the science or English or math classes that our kids are learning, but to add this in addition. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that, Ellie? I was just going to say, you know, we, when we began writing the program, we had this larger team, you know, that we were working with. And since then we've been working with a lot of young people. So we have a youth advisory council. So as we continue to kind of build out the lessons and grow the program, now we have incorporated a lot of young voices at the table as well. So, um, you know, we kind of launched it as with this group that, that began, um, that Sarah described so beautifully. And then we've grown it since then and had a lot of young people, um, who are, I think, bring a lot of expertise to what we've developed. And, and the one thing I'll just piggyback on what Ellie shared is the mental health experts that we have are really um, world renowned. We have some incredible scientific advisors from Stanford who helped us originally put together our resources and our curriculum. We have folks in the UCLA Department of Psychology that we have worked with and use those resources. So we've really gotten lucky to be able to lean on top experts in the fields of mental health as we've written these lessons. That's so great. And I think so many parents and educators and psychologists and you know, so many people would agree that this is really something that is so poignant and necessary for our youth today. Cause of course, you know, you need, you need your basic math, science, English, all of that, but the world has changed so drastically from when all of those models of schooling were created. Um, and there's just so much that kids today struggle with. And so I love that this is part of hopefully almost every curriculum <laughs> in the United States soon. Um, and, and on that note, is this available to every school? Is this rolling out public schools, private schools? What, where is this, where's this hitting and how do people get this in their school curriculum? That's right. You know, one of our strengths um, is that we are so flexible. We can, we've met with educators that teach every discipline you can imagine, math and business educators and health and language arts and after school programming and nonprofits. We know that the, well, the program that we've developed, what we've seen from our pilot data is that it's really a life-saving intervention. It can be this program that really helps students to feel less alone, to feel more connected with each other. And because we so believe in it, we're willing to work with anyone to find a way to fit it into their program. So this was our launch year. Um, we had two years of development prior to that, but this was our launch year starting in September. We're now um, delivering the program to more than 30,000 students, which is like wow. enormous growth to have in one year. And it's because of this kind of devotion that we have to finding a way to make it fit and help the educators to tailor it to each of their contexts. So regardless of the subject, um, we can um, you know find a way to plug it in. Primarily, we're sixth through college level, but we've also begun working with elementary educators, both to deliver the pedagogy that I described earlier of modeling vulnerability, and also to tailor the lessons that we've written to the younger age groups. So um, it's just effective in all those groups um, that, that we just mentioned. Sarah, would you fill anything else into that answer? I would just say that coaches, athletic directors, teachers, school counselors all deliver this curriculum, and we have it kind of runs the gamut of everything from summer programs to after school programs, um, independent schools, public schools, nonprofits all over the country. So we have a lot of different kind of school and nonprofit partners that we work with. And to Kevin, the most important thing was uh, taking away, not even reducing, but taking away any barrier for any students. So Ellie and I always kind of joke that we feel like we're like at Willy Wonka's factory handing out the golden ticket because we're saying this is a free curriculum. Our training is free. Um, the ongoing support you'll get from us is free. 
it's part, kind of our favorite part of our job, I think, is helping the schools, like Ellie said, customize and individualize the lessons for their needs. And um, schools don't have to replace this with existing SEL curriculum if they already have something that's working. Like Ellie said, some of the great joy we have in this job is helping schools figure out how it can work. It's not a competitive environment, right? It's kind of a more the merrier and you find what works for your students. What a win-win because I know so many school districts, I mean, why would you not want to have a resource like this? But so many of them have these criteria, obviously, that they have to meet and there's just not enough room always in the day to teach everything or add something in. So I love that you've designed it where it just fits seamlessly with what's already going on. Um, and free is great because of course we all know that, you know, there's not enough money going around most of these school districts. And so this is such a great design. Thank you, Kevin, <laughs> for making it free. Um, and I love that it sounds like you guys really took your time and did the research and took two years developing something that has substance that can be adapted to different circumstances. And now you're rolling it out. I feel like there's such a good quality usually to things that aren't rushed and aren't entirely motivated by money. And so I love that you have taken your time and really made it a good scientific, helpful resource. Um, and I think a lot of that is that it or benefit of that is that it will adapt to so many different environments and different age groups. It's great. I mentioned just a minute ago, the, um, some of the amazing findings that we had from our pilot, but I want to kind of flesh that out a little bit more because what you're saying about how, you know, devoted we were to ensuring that, that the program that we had developed was really impactful, um, was, you know, we were really meticulous about that. And in our, our pilot year was with 75 schools from across the country. And what we found from that data was that one of the biggest impacts that the program was having on students was on this feeling of belonging which we know is really hard to um, make that happen in a classroom environment, but in schools where belonging rates are really high, bullying rates are really low. So there, we should put our weight behind it, but it's hard to make it happen. Um, it doesn't always kind of click into place by doing kind of more, um, you know, surface level conversations, you know, what are your interests, shared interests, those kinds of connections don't always create that kind of deep belonging. But what we found in our data was that, you know, sharing stories with each other and developing empathy and care for, for students among each other and also between teachers and students um, is the practice that really helps students to feel that increased sense of belonging. And so 84% of students said, I feel after doing this program, a greater sense of belonging in the classroom. 82% of students said, you know, I'm more likely to reach out to my teacher if I go through something really hard in my life. Um, so that feeling of just having one trusted adult that they can rely on if they're really struggling. struggling. So those were two of the kinds of amazing findings that we saw in that pilot year. And prior to that, the research we had been doing on reciprocal vulnerability as part of the team that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we have just dozens of peer reviewed articles about that um, and conference presentations. And it's really Really, uh, um, we really vetted it um, at a high level because um, we wanted to ensure that it was best practice and, and that it was a trauma-informed approach that would really support students because the stakes are high. You know, we all see this like alarming CDC data as it rolls out. Um, you know, the most recent um, data that came out saying that, you know, I can't remember the exact statistics, but the rate of hopelessness and sadness um, had continued to increase, you know, anxiety and depression had continued to increase. So we wanted to be ensure that our, we want to ensure that our intervention was kind of speaking to to that. And we're, you know, we can say absolutely that it is. Those are really significant numbers and findings. That's really, really impressive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, at the beginning, I, we would we would go into rooms where with this pedagogy of modeling vulnerability, like we worked with a fraternity a couple of months ago, and Sarah was like, you know, I don't know, can I speak to this, Sarah? It's kind of a, yeah, of course. Like, Sarah said, you know, I'm not sure if this group is going to really connect with this particular lesson. It was a poetry writing activity, um, lesson two from our curriculum, and I said, I I know that they will. You know, if I go first and I share a poem that I wrote about a loss in my life, that is the thing that kind of opens the door, and so. So um, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was beautiful to see these young men write this poetry that was deeply vulnerable. Um, and it, it really is amazing that whatever room we go into, we also do a corporate model with adults. We are running a grief group um, with a group of adults at the LeBron James Family Foundation. We run a group of, um, we just trained the Ricky Martin Foundation's first responders um, in Puerto Rico. So we have all these diverse contexts that we also share the program beyond just the young people. And 
And it's just um, universally, it, it just works universally because we all need that permission that we can tell the truth about how we really feel. We want to be able to, to say it, but there's these norms in place in our culture that make us think that we have to pretend like everything's okay, even when it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ellie is exactly, kind, yeah, Ellie, is exactly Ellie is exactly right. I, um, I, that anecdote that she told about us kind of zooming in and virtually doing a workshop with a group of fraternity college students. Um, I did not think that a bunch of, you know, 20 and 21 year old and 19 year old boys would, would really open up to Ellie and I. And um, I was completely wrong. They were incredible and shared really vulnerably with each other and with us. And we have seen this work again and again. We have like endless beautiful stories of how we've seen people be surprised at how they connected to each other, whether it's teachers that were training in the training session or students that connect to each other that never had made a connection before. Um, We've really seen this over and over again. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Let's hear another example. So that's an example of teenagers. Do you have one maybe in a a school setting with younger kids or, you know, let's hear, let's hear some more examples of how this actually looks in real life. I can share, um, Ellie and I have just worked with the, um, we're working one of the partnerships that Kevin's really excited about is the Ohio School Safety Center. And um, they have been a great group of folks that have worked with us to uh, offer us as a resource to the 5,600 schools they serve in Ohio. And we were working with some of their um, advisory council. They have kind of a student advisory council that they put together throughout the state. And we were special guests for one of their monthly sessions, again, over Zoom. And we worked with about a dozen of these students and we had them do Um, In fact, the same poetry lesson that Ellie was referring to. And one young woman shared the most beautiful example of her, of a difficult time and experience with her family immigrating to this country and what they kind of went through and how she feels she didn't want to, she wanted so badly to embrace the American culture that she let go of her culture of origin. And now she doesn't feel like she's either identity. And as she was sharing this beautiful poem, another girl um, in the group just started crying, started weeping. And, and they had, oh, I think only met in person once before. And she said, you are sharing my words. This is exactly how I feel. And it was just the most beautiful. Ellie and I felt so honored to even be a part of this moment for them because she said I've really gone through this exact same thing with my family and I've never heard it I've never been able to articulate it in this way before even to myself let alone heard it spoken by someone else so she was really moved and touched and um, in fact reached out to us afterwards to say she wanted to do more work with the Kevin Love Fund because she was it meant so much to her the experience she had during that hour Wow. And that is so healing, you know, to have that connection with someone and it's almost like group therapy. (laughs) It's so healing. Well, we always say, you know, because teachers are delivering the curriculum and they're required to take a one hour free training, everything's free, as Sarah said, but we do want them to take one, a one hour training. And we talk talk about, about, you know, what does it mean to be a witness to your student stories? But what we found is that teachers are equipped at kind of creating a container that is, that does feel therapeutic to students. Most of the lessons are arts-based projects. So they're they're avenues of emotional expression and storytelling um, for students to kind of bring, give voice to something that they've been through in their life that they might not have um, had the opportunity to talk about. Um, and it's an experience for, of loss, for example, or the example Sarah gave is another really beautiful one. Um, and so because they're arts projects, the the storytelling and the creativity kind of does the heavy lifting. And then the teacher just shows up as this empathetic kind of um, can holding the space for the students. And, um, it is, it's incredibly therapeutic. Yeah. I want to zero in a little bit on your curriculum. Um, can you walk us through what are some of the resources that you offer particularly to schools or just, um, you know, all, all these stories are amazing. You have me hooked, but what does this look like practically? You know, what are, what are the curriculums that you offer? So I can share, I think the lesson design gives you the best kind of, um, 
understanding of what the curriculum is like. And then I know Sarah will, will join in with more um, because we kind of share the same brain. Um, so the, the lessons are project-based, which I spoke to earlier. That's also based on the research. We know that with adolescents um, and, and also with elementary level too, um, that project-based hands-on approaches are much more effective for social emotional learning. So students are always making something and that's in an alternative to an alternative to say a worksheet or a lecture. Um, so the teacher always begins by introducing the, the main idea of the lesson kind of briefly, and then they play a short video clip. We call these guest artist videos. Um, and these video clips we've had recorded by um, athletes and artists and actors that students will absolutely recognize in their lives. So for example, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda recorded an extraordinary video for one of our lessons about the way that he learned to use life experiences as fuel for his writing and emotion as fuel for his writing. And he talks also about empathy. It's a beautiful video. Um, Brian Cranston talked, uh, made a beautiful video for us about um, kind of questioning that negative voice in his head and um, really self-compassion is what that video is about. Um, Kevin recorded several videos that are beautiful and vulnerable. So these guest artist video clips um, help to model that vulnerability. So they're supporting the teacher in uh, modeling the vulnerability. And the speaker is talking about the main idea of that lesson. Um, we also have many videos from other young people, high school students and college students. Um, and then after playing the guest artist video, we have these short video clips that we call expert videos. And these are videos that have been recorded by world-renowned mental health experts. So authors, uh, researchers from Stanford that Sarah spoke about, about a few minutes ago, they're helping to teach the, the main idea of the lesson. Um, I always say, you know, I was a high school language arts teacher for many years. And if my principal had said to me, you know, I think Ellie, that you should teach cognitive behavioral therapy to your students. I think they would really benefit from that. I would have said, I am a language arts teacher. I do not know <laughs> how to do. I mean, I was, I had been in therapy myself, but I certainly didn't feel equipped to kind of communicate that nuanced idea. So the videos are these short five minute, very engaging. Many of them are funny. They can include diagrams. They're very clear, um, but they're helping the teacher to kind of deliver the, the meat of the skill or the tool. Um, and then the teacher introduces the creative project that the students are going to make to kind of internalize what they've just learned. And they do it by modeling it. So we've given the poetry example. So I'll return to that. The teacher would read um, for that lesson a poem that they had written about something difficult from their own life um, that they had experienced. And we train teachers in how to model vulnerability in really age appropriate ways. So they share their example project and then the students make the creative project. And that's their way, as I mentioned, of internalizing the skill that they've just learned from the expert. And then at the end of the lesson, there's this chance for students to share what they've created with each other if they want. So they might read their poem or share their collage, or um, we have a music playlist lesson. They might play a song that they picked for their music playlist. So that's an incredibly connecting kind of closure activity that we've seen um, in our and kind of in our lesson. And so that's the structure of each lesson plan. And then right now we have 14 lessons. Um, we're, we're rolling out another four in the fall. And the lessons are, you know, a main idea or, a, you know, a skill paired with this creative arts project. Um, Sarah, did, did I, do you want to, I feel like there's a piece I might have missed because I get excited and then I know I love listening to you talk about it. It's very exciting for me as well. I'm like, oh, I want to do these lessons all over. I, know. I always um, I that would do. I would add that if um, Aaron and Peter, while you're hearing us talk about this poetry lesson, you're like, ooh, I'm not a poet though. That would be really hard for me. Fear not, because it is a very easy way to express yourself and tell a story from your past. I actually find it easier than just writing a, a letter to someone because there's um, a sentence stem that starts you off. And we purposely chose as formal classroom teachers, very easy or at least simple, maybe it's not easy, but it's simple, uh, very simple ways for teachers and students to tell a challenging story or share a happy emotion or a happy time or a story of gratitude or love or appreciation for someone. And so we have all these different modalities. We do want students to feel comfortable going a little out of their comfort zone, but we've purposely chosen all these different forms of creative expression so that everyone is finding things that they're comfortable with, that they feel they can kind of thrive in and also surprise themselves with the output. 
um, which we see over and over again. And these lessons are about 45 to 60 minutes in length. I would add that just if you're a counselor or an athletic director or coach or teacher listening to this, um, and they can really fit in many different times throughout the school day, whether it's an advisory period and some educators will break it up into two half hour sessions because they only have their advisory group for 30 minutes or um, a mental health day. A lot of schools come to us when they have a mental health day or they're uh, um, responding to a crisis that's happened on their campus. We'll come in and help give tools to the ways their students might be able to process. And like when Ellie was mentioning the, um, the first responders work in Puerto Rico through the Ricky Martin Foundation, it was not something we thought of when we first wrote these lessons, but I thought how inspiring and beautiful this idea of helping first responders that when there is a, another crisis, they have this activity that they're prepared to do with a group of young people if they're in a shelter or after a, you know, a natural disaster or if they're together for some other reason. So it's, it feels so um, connecting to go through this one hour process and kind of get this idea of being a witness to someone's story and know how to respond um, and then have this in your tool belt as an trusted adult um, in the classroom or in the, you know, on the sports team for students to go to when they have a challenging time. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I interject one other piece that's really exciting um, that we've seen in kind of this preliminary data from this launch year? Um, and we actually presented it at the American Educational Research Association Conference in Chicago, which is that we found that our program was as impactful for teachers' mental health as it was for students. And we know that there's like a, an educator mental health crisis right now also, um, you know, partly because of the pandemic, because of lack of resources, et cetera. So it's a, it's a really a challenge. Um, and it's so exciting to see that when teachers have the opportunity to model the creative projects, they're also giving themselves the time to process some of those experiences that they've encountered, certainly over the last few years. We always say, and Sarah, I'm so glad you said this, we always say that the prize is in the process. So it's not the product that they create. It's not like a beautiful poem or a beautiful piece of art. It's the process of kind of expression. And, um, and so it's wonderful to also hear, I was thinking of, you know, the first responders, the care takers who are um, caring for others' mental health, and I'm thinking about some of your listeners that are, you know, probably your, your audience, um, that, that there's this opportunity to give ourselves this beautiful gift of these creative arts prompts um, to kind of um, process some of our own emotions. Yeah. And on that note, I did want to ask more. I'm noticing the theme of vulnerability from the staff or the teacher or the leader of the group first to then invite the audience or the students into vulnerability. So can you say more about why that is such an important aspect? Um, I mean, I, I kind of, kind of can guess where you're going from my psychology background, but I think it would be really <laughs> interesting to hear from what you found in your research of why that is such an integral aspect. And second follow-up question, I'm sure a lot of um, educators might be a little nervous about that idea. So how do you train them to be comfortable with that, or at least, um, have the tools to be able to do that when normally I feel like they're taught to just kind of be neutral. Those are Ellie, both. You, yeah. I was just saying, you can take the first question if you want, and I'll take the second. You guys are so organized. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, yes. So, um, as I said, this was a 10 year study where we were looking at educator vulnerability. And what we were finding is, I mean, we were drawing on this larger body of research, um, about emotion in school. So Megan Bowler wrote a really great book, um, about the history of emotion in school. And, you know, there's this binary understanding of like public private. We think that, you know, our feelings are allowed in some spaces and not allowed in some, some other spaces and that schools in particular are places for thinking, but not feeling. So so even the idea of like embodiment, like how's your body feeling, isn't something that we encourage students to, we historically, that we've encouraged students to do very much. You know, we're just kind of like, well, what do you think about this? And so to, to move the needle and have students like drop into their body and how they're feeling in school requires a shift in the norms. And so one way that we found is really effective to change those norms is to have a, a leader or a mentor, or a, you know, someone that the students respect to model that. Now, the good news is, is, um, and I don't want to cut too much into your answer, Sarah, but the good news is it doesn't necessarily have to be the teacher. Um, so we found in that research I'm mentioning, it's very effective when it is the teacher, um, but we have some workarounds in our curriculum for those educators that don't feel comfortable. And now I'll pass it over to Sarah. 
I was just going to say, um, Ellie and I do these podcasts and meetings and training so often that we can like finish each other's sentences. But I was going to add that if you were a teacher, sometimes there's teachers that have many years, decades of experience teaching the content, but they're, they've been trained actually not to share personal stories and not to talk. I mean, I was I'm in my late 40s and when I um, was first a classroom teacher in my 20s, I was told not to tell anything personal about my, and I know clinicians are often even now uh, feel they have to really hold a professional boundary. So I think that's where we found that our answer was the guest artists and expert videos. So like Ellie said, a teacher is certainly not um, equipped to teach about cognitive behavioral therapy, nor should they be. And so that's why we have our expert video, which is a, a succinct six minute explanation that's great for students. And then if a teacher is not comfortable or a, a athletic director is not comfortable talking about a challenging story in their lives, and that's not part of their kind of natural style of teaching, they have these guest artist videos that become like a co-teacher with them. So they can still create this safe space and not be the, the one who shares something vulnerable, or they might share something that they feel is age appropriate and that is intentional for their group of students for what they might be going through now, but they might pick one of our videos. So every lesson that we have, we have this kind of rich, diverse body of videos now that you can choose from as the educator delivering our curriculum, because we know we are not experts in your school community, you are. And so we wanna present this as kind of a menu. So there are options for educators to choose and that can act as the modeling of vulnerability. That's really nice. That's a good, good option. Yeah. Go ahead, Ellie. I was going to say the other thing that the videos do and the teacher modeling does is that it's showing students that, you know, there's still this like, and I'm sure it's really frustrating for you as well. And I'm sure you hear it all the time. There's still this like misunderstanding around certain emotions as though sadness or anger or anxiety are like the, the emotions we're trying to like get rid of. And then if we like learn a special tool, then we could just feel good all the time. And like the idea that like, well, actually the, that's not, it's not like, um, a broken machine. You know, if you're feeling sad or angry or anxiety, it's not like, oh, well, you're deficient or you're broken and we have to fix you. It's more like, this is the human experience. Like we wanted the stories that students watch to communicate to them. Like this is part of what it means to be human. If you love someone, the other side of love is loss, right? It's like, if you are going after your dreams and your goals, part of that process includes anxiety. Like we're just trying to like normalize and take away that stigma. And that that was really one of Kevin's goals. He wanted students to feel, um, you know, less alone and, you know, like there's not something wrong with them if they're feeling these hard emotions. And the videos really do that because we tried to get a different type of story, all the types of stories that we could, and we're still building this bank, but we wanted to have so many different types of stories. So students could just really see their story reflected back at them and know, oh, I'm not broken. I'm a human. And that's also what the teacher modeling does as well. I think that's really powerful because I think a lot of kids and teens today are so disconnected. Um, it's already a disconnecting time, tweens and teens, but even more so now than it used to be. And so I think a lot of them feel, at least what I saw clinically, a lot of them feel that their negative emotions are the only ones, or it's like, right. maybe if they're sad, they think they're depressed, or if they're anxious, they think they're having right. panic attacks. And really a lot of, maybe they are, but a lot of it is very normal and mm -hmm. um, they don't know it's normal because no one's talking about it. So I think there's a lot of power in the program you have to demystify that and that way you can create coping skills for it instead of having this additional layer of, oh my gosh, I'm so broken. Something's horribly wrong with me on top of trying to deal with basic sadness or anxiety or fear or failure. Um, th these lessons are really reminding me, I did a lot of training in school settings, um, as a clinical psychologist working with kids and teens. And so, um, a lot of it, a lot of what I do is a little bit more psychological, but a lot of the actual projects or, um, group environments where we would discuss vulnerability. A lot of those interventions are really similar to what we were doing in school settings, but I love your program because we were there as a limited resource when things got really bad. So we were working with mm -hmm. kids who were already deep in trauma or very disruptive to the classroom. And, um, you know, I, I love the idea of teaching similar skills as a proactive method or as a, um, coming alongside kids who are beginning to struggle before letting it get 
really difficult, really bad. And then doing this, you know what I mean? There's so much resilience. I think that your program is going to build for, I mean, I know we're talking about kids at the moment, but really for any age. So it's a beautiful, well, it's, beautiful it's, model. It's interesting that you share that because it reminds me even, I think Kevin's initial goal was, I wish I had had these tools when I was younger. And even when I um, was getting my master's in human development studies at Vanderbilt, I remember learning about, and Ellie and I talked about it when we first started writing these lessons, I had first, I mean, really paid attention to Eric Erickson, the theorist who talks about the different stages of life. And I remember as an adult, when I learned about that, um, thinking, wow, this really helps explain um, a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, relationships I've had. And it was like, it really answered a lot of kind of unanswered questions for me. And I thought this is really critical. And when we were all putting these lessons together, this is the kind of stuff we were talking about when I say like coming around the table and talking about really critical things that we as adults think, I wish I had known this when I was younger. It would have really helped me understand and have a larger context, which is hard when you're a teen, like you're saying. It's hard to not feel you're alone or it's so exaggerated. We even talk about cognitive distortions yeah. in our in our lessons. So we're trying to teach teens like what you're thinking could be inaccurate. This could be catastrophic thinking, exaggerated thinking. So and and we find over and over again that our students are telling us um how helpful this is. Absolutely. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um and you've already mentioned a lot of positive outcomes you're noticing, like even increased teacher mental wellness or mental health. And I'm sure you're seeing less um, impulsive or disruptive behaviors in the classroom. What, what else are you noticing? What are the positive outcomes of this program? You know, we have these end of the year um, live feedback sessions with teachers. And after our, um, after our last year's feedback session towards the end of it, one of the teachers said to us, oh, I invited some students to come because they wanted to say something to you. Oh, and I love that. Two, yeah, these two kind of like upperclassmen, they were probably 11th or 12th grade, popped into the screen and said, well, we just want to tell you there was a, another kid in the class who no one really knew and we didn't really like him. And after the Kevin Love lessons, that's what they call them, the Kevin Love lessons, um, we we had his back, you know, when we saw him outside in the hallway and we we felt like we understood him more. And so now we have his back. And I just thought that was such an amazing, authentic, incredible feedback that we got that these kids who kind of probably, it seems like, looked down on this other young man in class because they didn't understand him and they didn't know why he was acting the way he did. Once they saw a little bit of why and heard him they humanized him and suddenly they started to protect him and feel a sense of connection and were more like um connected to him more friendlier outside of the classroom yeah what's that phrase like you it's, it's really easy to be frustrated with someone until you know their story right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah ellie do you want to add anything to that anything you're yeah. noticing as positive outcomes I have another story that popped in my mind that I think illustrates one of the outcomes we've seen for sure, which is, you know, so much of our culture is about like, here's a bunch of things that will help you to feel. And we're trying to send this alternative message, which is the only way out is through, you know, like we have this one lesson that feelings are a wave that if you're willing to like stick with it, tell the story and ride the wave to the other side, you know, there's, there's something waiting for you there that's peaceful and that, you know, running to drinking or, you know, smoking or whatever you're going to, you know, smoking pot or whatever it is that, or video games, or, you know, there's just so many things that we can do to feel better fast. It won't get you to that peaceful feeling, but feeling the feeling will. And uh, I know that I'm preaching to the choir because you've been a change agent in the space for a long time. But one of the things, one of the stories that is a great example of it is we talked with a teacher who said, you know, I have a student that any time I tried to, you know, he had a really complicated relationship with his parents and had experienced a lot of trauma. And any time in the class that the teacher kind of touched on anything that was um, vulnerable or that was about emotion at all, he would get up and leave and, and never come back. That was the end for the day. And something about our curriculum and the fact that Kevin was, it was the letter lesson, which is our first lesson, the fact that Kevin shared his letter first. And, you know, Kevin is this role model of someone who's this like, you know, really 
for a lot of young men is an example of an alternative way of kind of managing difficult emotions. And so by t speaking about them, and so, you know, he shares a video in this lesson, or we have a video of Kevin in this lesson, and then everybody writes a letter. And this teacher said, you know, he got up, he started to write this letter. He got up, he left the room, but then he came back. It was the first time he ever came back. Wow. And it just gives me goosebumps to think about that. And this is just one example of the many, many um, that, that we have kind of in our story bank, but we see it again and again, that it's new information to them that if they ride the wave, there's a, a place at the other side. It's not like I'll cry mm -hmm. forever. You know, it's like, I'll mm -hmm. feel it. And then I'll get something for that's waiting for me. That's different than if I had used an addictive, you know, kind of alternative. And it's and so you know, true Kevin, what you're saying. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, Kevin um, named this curriculum, everyone is going through something you can't see. You know, like that was his idea. And it really is what we see every single yes. time we work yes. with students or teachers. That that simple idea of like one person, even if it's a completely different story, there's always something yeah. in what someone shares that you can see resonates with everyone else. You can see it touch. And when we do this, you can see the energy change, whether it's in the physical classroom or in the Zoom room, you can feel the energy shift in the space when people start to tell their stories. And when we give them a structured way to do that, um, it's, a, it's a gift. Like we'll say, um, take 10 minutes to do this activity. And it really is a gift that teens and adults are giving themselves to pause and, honor their emotions and express them in this structured way. Mm -hmm, definitely. And for, our, and for ourselves as well, you know, we do this, this, we do a lot of writing activities and sometimes I'll take the time to do it for myself. And I'll be like, oh my gosh, I didn't, pro I'm, I'm here. We are make them. I don't know if you experienced this either, but like, I know the tools, but do I really do them? Like taking that 10 minutes to like really notice how I'm feeling. Like it's a gift to, to anyone that, that takes the time to do it. And that's one reason why we have some nonprofits that are in their third year of doing this curriculum, same lessons, because the prompts are open-ended and whatever you're feeling, having the time and a prompt to get you started is really all you need, right? To get kind of get going with, with um, processing whatever it is that that's going on in your life. So it might change from year to year. And um, that's why they can repeat the same lessons we've, we've found. Mm -hmm. We've gotten that's, that's feedback. We've gotten feedback that students, um, we have new lessons coming out um, this coming year, but we've gotten feedback that uh, all of really, I think all of our partners at schools and nonprofits have said, we want to have like kind of a favorite that we go back to every year because the familiarity of returning to the same activity with different emotions, like we have a protest art lesson and what students are concerned about or upset about um, year to year changes. And they have a lot that they want to express in that way. So it's a comfortable way to return to something that now feels a little bit more familiar and safe for them to express their emotions. Yeah. I could easily see how that would integrate into a classroom setting and could be used in, in different ways and different methods over and over again, <laughs> because everybody's always growing and changing or the feelings change. Yeah. That's the whole point. Yeah. Um, well, as we start to wrap up, is there anything that you would want to say or a message you'd want to leave with administrators or teachers who might be listening to this and are interested in, in the program? I was going to say, um, if you are an educator, um, whether it's if you're a teacher, school counselor, coach, um, if you are interested in this curriculum, you can go onto our website and there is a contact us section that pops right up. And we have um, general curriculum intros that are about 20 or 30 minutes. And then we have trainings that we constantly deliver every week, just an hour. And if you're just interested in learning about it individually, you can come to those. And then if you have your whole staff wanting to be trained for, let's say, a professional development hour, um, we are able to schedule with individual organizations to do that. Okay. And what is the website where they could start? It's kevinlovefun.org. Okay. And we'll definitely put that in the show notes so people can find okay. it easily. Great, um, thank you. Ellie, any last words, anything you want to add? I was just going to say, you know, I think when I was a teacher, I thought I have so much I have to teach. I don't have time to devote to, you know, something that's extra, like on the side, I have to teach Hamlet. I have to teach Catcher in the Rye. Like I had a content. What I've learned, what I've seen over the last three years is that these lessons are not extra. They help the students to be able to do well in 
every area of their lives, including their academic lives, their athletic lives, their extracurriculars, their, you know, that when you give students these tools for managing their emotions and building positive relationships, it will spill over into your school and have a big positive um, impact. So I would say it's worth taking that 45 minutes um, to, to teach students these tools. And we, yeah. hope, we, we hope to be able to, to give it away to thousands more this year coming, coming up in September. So please reach out. Yeah. And from the clinical psychologist perspective, I have to agree, right? Because we know if you're not comfortable managing the negative feelings, then like you were talking about earlier, you find a way to shut them down or numb them, but you can't just numb the negative ones. It numbs your whole brain and your whole life. And if you're not able to navigate what you're feeling, there's no way you're going to remember anything or be able to study those parts of your brain. Actually, the volume turns down essentially, or sometimes even shuts off completely, depending how distressed you are. So it's, it's funny how schools are supposed to prepare people for the world and to, you know, let them be successful. But I do feel that they're missing this social emotional key element to create the foundation to actually learn and think critically and move forward and create relationships. So yeah, that's such a valuable, valuable program and, um, even better that it's free. So <laughs> hopefully well, we people will check really, it out. We feel really lucky that you had us on. So thank you for for having us so we could talk about this. We just believe of course. in it so passionately. Yeah, yes. no, it's been my pleasure. It's been really interesting to learn. And um, I'm very grateful to be hearing about people like you and the foundation, the Kevin Love Foundation that are trying to bridge this gap for what our kids need and, and really adults too. I know you take it multiple contexts, um, but yeah, what a valuable resource. So thank you both for taking the time to be here. And I can tell you have podcast experience because it was very easy to discuss <laughs> as a panel with both of you without tripping over each other. So you kind of do share the same brain. I can see it. <laughs> Well, thank you for such thoughtful questions. And um, I felt like you really held the space for us as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, again, thank you guys so much. And I also want to thank our listeners for being here today. Just a reminder that the resources we mentioned for this episode and an archive of all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. And we look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today.